This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 153 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have two old friends that have been around horses forever, and y'all love them. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my trusty producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings, Debbie. I'm so excited we're going to learn about riding style and improving your riding style all in the same episode. All in the same episode. That's right. And we, we've got a, a wooden horse to ride with Frankie Lovato, too, right? The first time I ever sat on one of his equisizers, and you will mm-hmm. learn all about what an equisizer is shortly right. when Frankie comes on. I'm looking at this thing going, I don't know. It's a horse. <laughs> it's got some springs. That can't possibly do what he says it does. <laughs> He's a jockey. Jockeys ride different than regular people, right? They do. That's true. Right? They, can't, they can't do that. And I sat out and went, dang, it does. <laughs> yeah. It, it got you, didn't it? Yeah. Do you was, remember where you were? I remember we were where I was. I was some Ohio. Equine Affair? Equine Affair. Ohio Equine Affair. And I was Massachusetts at Grand Affair. So oh, those really? guys got right. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. It was really fun. He, his booth was, well, his, his equisizers were a few rows over. And I just, I heard people giggling, I, you know, all mm-hmm. those things. And it's fun. And it, it, it's a workout too. But it's such a great um, builder of the, the feeling of being on a horse. And I mean, he's made a, a career out of it. It's really cool. And it's a family owned business that I just love their ethic. And, and he's really, he's getting back into the swing. I don't know if he'll be traveling as much as he used to, but boy, they used to work their tails off. And now I, I think, you know, he, he, uh, got quiet for a little bit and then maybe his kids maybe spurred him on. So, um, let's encourage him. And I can't wait to hear your squeals of delight when you <laughs> hear him talk, Matt. He's really, he's really a sweetie, isn't there is, he? There is no kinder soul than Frankie yeah. Lovato. And that, and that's something that has always amazed me is I don't know a lot of professional jockeys, but the few I have met are genuinely kind souls. And that, and when you see them, the only time you see them is on TV, right? Triple crown, yeah. high pressure right. situations, riding big, strong horses. Yeah. That's just never what I expect. And they are such kind souls. And Frankie really embodies that. And he, it's a, it's a labor of love from beginning yes. to end when he makes these and helps people um, of all sorts, whether you are an able-bodied rider, a disabled mm-hmm. rider, someone who doesn't ride at all, someone who has, physical uh, shortcomings that you want to improve upon, those all apply. And it's really kind of cool. And then with Dr. Kane, she's, Mm. she's taking on the mental aspect of it. How, how Mm. helping people wrestle with what kind of propensities they have as far as interacting with their horses to help them be better trainers, which is kind of cool. It is. It is. And she loves her horses, too. So, yeah, that's the the theme today is these two people have been involved with horses pretty much their whole lives and they love their horses. And they love it and they want to help everybody get better at what they do. So we're going to get right with Frankie right after we hear from our title sponsor, Omega Fields. You're more than just a horse and rider. You're a team. And Omega Fields delivers the science and performance you need to hold up your end of the bargain. Omega Fields creates, discovers, and shares products that naturally bring the best out in the horses we love. Here's what Crystal Founds has to say about her experience with Omega Horse Shine. When I began building my career as a trainer and professional horsewoman, I knew that only the best would do for the equines in my care. Over the years, I've spent countless hours researching to ensure that I'm recommending and utilizing the equine industry's most cutting-edge products. I look for tack, fly spray, supplements, etc. that are made with love and created with top-notch technology, quality, and whenever possible, sustainability. I raised my first foal in 2013 and adopted my first OTTB in 2014. Providing the best nutrition and finding what worked for them as individuals was quite the journey. 
After much trial and error and varying feeding routines, I discovered Omega Horseshine. I had tried multiple biotin products that had good reviews, but just didn't produce the results I was looking for. Within 30 days of being on Horseshine, I watched my geldings transform before my eyes. After three to four months, they were as shiny as dream horses. Their manes and tails grew longer. My thoroughbred became as beefy as I knew he could be. And to this day, he looks like a warm blood. They're able to maintain a barefoot lifestyle, even under work, handle adjustments in terrain and seasons, and show a healthy amount of hoof growth between farrier visits. I highly recommend Omega Horseshine and can't wait to try more Omega Fields products. Frankie Lovato has been a thoroughbred jockey, an inventor, an educator of horse racing, and his racing career spanned from 79 to 2004 with a total of 15,604 mounts. Isn't that amazing? And 16... 1,686 wins, finishing in the money in another 3,506 races. That's about as good as it gets. Frankie began his professional riding career at age 16, earned the Eclipse Award for Apprentice Jockey in 1980, and then after an accident left him with a badly fractured left leg in 1981, he created the Equisizer as a means to rehabilitate. He retired in 2004 and moved his family to his wife's hometown in North. Ohio, where he builds the Equisizers today. Well, welcome, Frankie Lovato. I have never had you on. I am so pleased to have you. How are you? Great, Debbie, and and thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Oh, we met years ago, and I had the most fun. I believe it was an equine affair. I can't remember if it was Ohio or Massachusetts, but, you know, the building I recall, the Equisizer I recall, you and Sandy I recall, the warmest, wonderful people. I'm so glad you're doing well. And, yeah, and it's a family business, which, of course, I so appreciate. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Equisizer because this is one of those unique things out in the world. It's kind of like our, we have a, a dummy rider, you know, it's a little exercise rider and it, it just helps people uh-huh. so much to have and horses to have a transition from one thing to another. So I, I, the first thing I think is probably important to know is that you came from a horse background first. And I wanted to hear a little bit about that. Were you, did you grow up riding horses? I think your dad was a pretty famous jockey, as I recall. Yeah, so th- that was kind of what started the whole thing with the, with the concept of not actually having access to horses um, when I was a very young kid and being obsessed with the idea of wanting to be. <laughs> my my dad was a was a professional jockey, and I, I of course wanted to be a jockey as well. But when you're in horse racing, you're usually your home is usually not in, in the country, so you know it's it's in the suburbs type areas and. And um, we didn't have a horse farm or anything. And my only access to horses was just tagging along with my dad and going to the racetrack, which limited what I could do. <laughs> and yeah. being three or four or five years old, uh, there wasn't, I wasn't allowed to do a lot. Yeah. So I used to make things. <laughs> I used to pretend oh. and make things and saddle up the couch and whatever I could uh, to pretend I was riding a horse. And that's kind of where when people say, where'd you get the idea from? I said, well, I kind of been building horses my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I couldn't get one to eat hay. So yeah. So he wouldn't let, you, he wouldn't let a, his three-year-old up on one of those thoroughbreds there at the racetrack. I guess not, huh? <laughs> yeah. They have some rules. They have, I mean, they, you know, <laughs> limitations. Well, some limitations and probably for good reason, but, but yeah, yeah so, th- so that's great. You're, you're a horse family way back, but, when did you decide that you wanted to follow in your dad's footsteps? Because kids don't always do that. Right. Well, I was obsessed with horse racing and, and wanting to be a jockey. And so I, I'd left home at an early age. I was in my young teens. And I actually started riding professionally at age 16. So I was riding races professionally at 16. And the year, my first year of riding, I was I was awarded the Eclipse Award, which is the highest achievement award you can win in horse racing. <laughs> I'm very blessed and proud of that. I won a ton of races really, really fast, and then I broke my leg. Um, and it was a it was a pretty bad break that I, I needed some extensive rehab. And that's when the Equisizer really started. The idea that any athlete or anybody, you know, if you're a horse rider, 
And then you go to a physical rehabilitation center, and they could have state-of-the-art equipment. There's nothing there that'll tell you you can sit on a horse or ride a horse. Mm -hmm. And so my frustration with that, with that was why I created the Equisizer. I made myself a horse that I could actually pretend. I, it, yeah. Saddle, it was the barrel of a horse, the neck, the, the face of a horse. I could put a set of reins on and the saddle on and ride. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should describe the Equisizer a little bit because this is not your put a quarter in it in the front of the grocery store kind <laughs> of <laughs> little mechanical horse. It's it's quite, quite complicated. Tell us about it. Right. So that's the other thing, like the confusion. See, there, there's a, I'm, I'm one of the only, I, I am the only one of its kind, the Equisizer. It's a non-motorized mechanical horse. But it's also like a piece of furniture. When I made it, I, I anticipated that it wasn't just going to be out, left outside or in the garage. I wanted it in the house where it was convenient for me to ride. So I tried to make it look like a part of the family <laughs> or the mm -hmm. furniture. Yeah. And, of course, I, it wasn't getting popped out of a mold either. So yeah. um, I was making um, – I made my first horse and then a few other of the, the jockeys that kind of were going through the same thing I was going through had asked me if I would make them one. And, and that's how it was more or less born. The Equisizer itself, it's, it's a very simple con concept. Like, as I mentioned, it's, it's not motorized, which if you're going through rehab or if you have a disability or for whatever reason, it, it's not going to push you through a movement or it's not going to do something unpredictable that could hurt you. Mm -hmm. So I was actually able to ride my, my wooden horse very, very carefully, very under, very under control, before I was off crutches. So, you know, think about that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, um, you can't do that with a horse. Just couldn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and if it was motorized, that would probably even, you know, yeah. that would that would fall into the same category. So my, my idea was to create something uh, that was very safe, very simple, practical, that you can you can basically saddle up and ride it. You can ride it from your seat or you can ride it from the two point like jockeys do. Mm -hmm. And it reacts to your energy. So if you're using your seat, it, it'll move underneath you by the amount of energy you, you drive with your seat. So you have your driving seat, your stilling seat, and your passive seat, and all those things you can do on the Equisizer. It's almost like an exercise bike, but for horse people. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but that so movement... Scary. Yeah, that movement is, I, I think that does it a disservice if people are thinking about their exercise bike that they're probably hanging their clothes off of right now that they might right. not use. But because the smoothness and the glide and everything is so cool, I think this is where we should make the leap into why is it not only great for rehabilitation, but why is it great to help you maybe perfect your position and alignment and some of those things that your maybe your coach can even help you through while you're on this horse, yeah. this exerciser. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too. It's it's the barrel of a horse, and you have you have the movement that you have to, uh, you have to use your position and you have to use your hips just like you should properly on on yeah. on a real horse. So it helps riders that may may have a little too upper body or out of position. It helps them kind of hold their position and, and be more like instead of trying to worry about their horse, if they're sitting on the equisizer, they're they're able to think about themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and using your hips, it's it's using the the, um, the the lower part of your 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 spine. You know that that part that is so important for the canter. Um, to to have that that mobility there and, and to be able to to have a lot of your control with your seat. So if you need your horse to go faster, you you push with your hips, and, and if you want to go slower, you 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 still with your hips. You slow down with your hips, or if you want to maintain speed. So it's all very simple, and the equisizer can help you mimic that and exercise those muscles that you would be using when riding a real horse and maintaining your, your position and form and alignment. Right. And it looks kind of like, I mean, it, it, it's beautiful and it looks like a horse, but mm, it's much thanks. shorter so that you can have a coach next to you or, you know, you're, it's not like you have to go get the mounting block <laughs> to get up on this exerciser. So it's lo low to the ground, kind of stretched out, but the movement so mimics a horse. It's pretty amazing. I, uh, I, I've i never yeah. seen anything like it. And, and I think people would probably have to even get on it to totally understand what we're saying. But what I like about it is it's fair for the horse. 
And, and I mean that in all sincerity that like that dummy rider that we put up, it's because being fair to the rider too, maybe that horse is, you know, unpredictable enough that we don't want to put a rider up just yet until we see how he reacts with the dummy rider. But that dummy wow. rider gives us an opportunity to do some transition work with the horse in order to have him see above him that there can th be things way above, you know, three feet above his his uh, wither. And, and that's fair to the horse. And here on Horsemanship Radio and in, in our whole family's life, it's always been what's fair to the horse. I think this equisizer right. is a great leap for people to be fair to the horse, to develop those better habits, um, or even to build up your core when you, you know, how, how many hours can you ride your horse? You can, you know, you don't want to, if you exactly, really yeah. want to develop that core and you only have one horse to ride, this gets you a longer day and more muscle work, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, so, we have so many different types of customers, but one thing is, is, is if you're only able to put, if you're lucky, you know, maybe, maybe four or five hours a week, which is a, a lot for the average person in mm -hmm. the saddle, if they're able to ride on the weekend or, or whichever, or if they miss a weekend, you, you lose that time in the saddle. And, and I know as a professional jockey, we have to ride horses every single day to be at our best. Yeah. And for, as a jockey, it's another reason why the equisizer was fantastic because I could put in, if I if I wasn't able to simulate riding, or if I wasn't able to ride uh, two or three races a day, I'd start losing my fitness. So yeah. I could actually put in a couple extra extra time in the saddle, and and same goes for for any rider. Just trying to to maintain your your tone and, and your muscle, your fitness, your flexibility, all that stuff is is so important. If you could. You could do it in the convenience of your home and, and in your pajamas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Won't well, you look silly, but that's all good. So <laughs> um, one of the things I was reading on some of the attributes of it, too, and I and I get the core. I get how you, you'd have a softer back maybe from it in the Western saddles and and softer hands. Tell me about the Equisizer and how it responds to your hands. So when when I design, design this it, as a jockey, I mean the the neck the, the motion of a horse's stride is is what we we use our hands, right? So we're out of the saddle, but with other other all other disciplines of riders that ride from their seat, they ride from their seat. But it's important that your hands follow the stride of the horse and, and have soft hands, have flexible elbows, and the equisizer's neck moves and it moves similar. Like if you were to simulate the if you were to watch a horse walk or at a canter, and you see how their spine reacts and how their head and, and neck have, have like basically kind of bob up and down. Mm -hmm. This is what I did with the Equisizer. Uh, it's, a, it's a separate pivot point, and it, it, it reacts to the movement of the body. So it's not, like a, it's not like a rocking horse where it's just one solid block of, of, uh, of wood or an apparatus. The neck moves separately from, from the body, so it creates that that sensation of a horse that would be walking and their spine would be reacting reacting to the four beat gate of the walk or the three beat gate of the canter mm -hmm. where the where the neck and head are, are bobbing up and down and your hands have to react to that so you're not just bracing on the horse's face for balance or 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 uh, you know as you reaction you're 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 having to let go and mm -hmm. follow yeah. So it helps. It helps a lot of riders that struggle with that. Yeah, exactly. Or a lot of riders need that more too, I think. And so, yeah. And so if you can have somebody, again, a, your trainer, your coach, or somebody who may work with you a little bit to watch you do that, not on your horse, is, I think some advantages too. It, it's hard for trainers sometimes to simulate that problem yeah. Without, you know, if you're not on a horse, it's hard to, yeah. Anyway, I think it's it's a great tool for that. What what kind of purchasers do you have? Do you equestrian centers buy this or what? what's it's, your it's typical? Such a mixed, it's it? such a mixed bag. So we, a lot of private homes, uh, mostly women that are maybe had their had horses when they were growing up and had their kids and they want to get back to riding. Uh -huh. um, we have some instructors, some trainers. We have uh, several therapeutic riding programs oh, um, yes. that, that do adaptive riding, therapeutic riding, and hippotherapy that will use this as a tool as well. And it's everything's used in coincision co co with a real horse. So okay. um, we do have some customers that aren't able to ride anymore mm -hmm. that 
their doctors think that this is a great idea and a great option for them. But you're not trying to replace horses, right, Frankie? No, <laughs> there's there's never. And even even you could have the best simulator uh, made by NASA. Yeah. <laughs> nothing's going to replace. <laughs> nothing's going to replace the horse. This is just a tool. It's a bridge that connects from nothing to a horse mm-hmm. to having something, and, and that's what. That's what it really is. Very simple. It gives you an option, an opportunity to put time in the saddle. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, I trust you more than NASA with horses, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you're the one who created the Equifactor, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm so glad to hear more about it. I hope people will go to your. I love the name of your your um, company, to Wooden Horse Corporation, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, that makes it sound pretty simple. But how do people get a hold of you? Well, we have our, our website's probably our biggest uh, place where they can learn more, and that, that is Equisizer. And the spelling of that is the toughest part. So yeah. Equisizer spelled E-Q-U-I-C-I-Z-E-R. I even struggled there for a second. No, no, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Equisizer.com. Uh, yeah, Equisizer.com. You're in Ohio, and you ship everywhere, I assume. Everywhere. Yeah. You, okay, you, good. It's it's. Amazing where I get orders from. All where's over the, the most world, exotic? So. Where's the most exotic place you've shipped one so far? Off Push the top out. of my head, uh, South Africa, Vietnam. Wow. Um, Hong Kong. We do a lot of business with Japan. Yeah. Uh, you know, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. Hard to have um, horses there, I guess. You know, high rise horses. <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong right. too, actually. Their their Sha Tin racetrack is it's up. They. They, it's m- multiple stories up, and the horses go up <laughs> instead of sideways. <laughs> they don't have any room. So, yeah, right. you need a few equisizers there, I think, too. I think I've seen a few equisizers maybe in Panama at a uh, Lafitte Pinkai yeah. school. Mm-hmm. Yep, Lafitte yeah. Pinkai. He has his jockey school down there, and, yeah. and he's got a couple down there. We, we've reached re, we've reached about 30 countries. Wow. And, yeah. and I'm still this little business, and I'm still this guy. I'm still making the horses myself. You're um, amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> I can't find anybody crazy enough to help me make them yet. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> as long as it's not a control <laughs> it, it, thing. <laughs> it, no, no, it's not a control thing. It's just okay. a, it's it's the craftsmanship and 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 just trying to. I need an apprentice. So <laughs> there you go. That's right. We need a little uh, or some elves or something. Pinocchio yeah. or some elves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and, and you're like now that. into social media, so people can follow you on Facebook and Twitter. And do they look under Equisizer or Frankie Lovato? Yeah, it, they could do either or. But we have we have pages for both the Equisizer itself and or Wooden Horse Corporation. And then my personal page, Frankie Lovato. And people are always welcome to contact me and ask questions. You know, one thing I think I've realized that when, when, I do, when I've done this business or how long I've been doing this business is a lot of people they're skeptical when they first they first see it and meet me and I, and one thing I never try to shove this down anybody's throat it's just it's very simple it just gives you an option to put more time in the saddle so I decided instead of calling it like I don't like to call it a simulator I don't like to to mm-hmm. to try to sell it I I, I basically say it, it's based, think of it as a, a piece of furniture that you can ride so mm-hmm. it's very simple mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't yeah. ride your couch. That's um, right. Well, I've, my kids used to try, so this would have been great to have when they were little. <laughs> it's like, exactly. Then get off that couch and get on the equalizer. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would have I been know, good that's for what boys. I, just sitting on the couch watching TV, you think, why am I sitting on the couch when I could be riding my equalizer? That's so. right. <laughs> you could be building your core for your horse. Your horse would agree with this, so... You your know. horse would love you for it. Exactly. There's your there's your t- <laughs> tagline right there. Your horse will love you okay. for it. Thank you. <laughs> we got a new marketing plan. <laughs> exactly. All cool. right. It's so fun to have you on. I hope we'll have you back again, Frankie, when you've got some uh, developments going on and maybe some new articles written about you. We want to hear how this grows with you, you and your family. And we're um, we're at Christmas time. You want to send our blessings from our family to yours. And, and same same, Debbie. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm honored to be a part of your show and big fan of your dad's always uh, wishing you all the very best in these, these holidays. Thank you kindly. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. 
You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges, and a few are downright sad. Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized, and everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. Dr. Susan Kane is a business consultant and a coach, author and a mother, as well as a lifelong equestrian. She is a partner at the Corporate Learning Institute in Chicago, Illinois, and she teaches at several Chicago area business schools. She coaches, designs, facilitates and assesses the needs of her client to plan the best way forward. She's been a coach to numerous Fortune 500 companies, and she's the creator of Riding Styles, creating a breakthrough relationship with your horse, and developed two new style assessments designed to help equestrians create breakthrough relationships with humans. Well, welcome back, Dr. Susan Kane. How are you? Well, I'm well. How about yourself? Good. Long time no hear from. But I know you're out there doing it. I know you're out there running equestrian centers and doing what you can for the, you've got a cape on helping horses. I know you do. Yeah. Yeah. We've done a lot of writing and writing both. Both. W's and R's too. I know. I'm really excited about this. Okay. So we've made some promises about writing styles and we've, we've had lots of iterations of this guide to um, looking in and amongst our our own souls for how we cause our horse to react in good ways and bad ways and always, but how we affect our horses. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about the latest iteration and the breakthrough stories that you're getting when you're on the road doing these uh, trade shows and or just talking to people about their horses. So the first obvious question is, what is it that the writing styles assessment is all about? Sure. Let me back up and say that you and I as co-authors have found it fascinating to take Monty Roberts' concepts mm -hmm. and apply them outside the equine world, but also play around with them inside the equine world. And yeah. so to that extent, we've written two books that are on Amazon. Ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the first one, Debbie? Let me remember. I know what it is. It's life lessons from the man who listens to horses. Exactly. Very it good. A field it's guide. A it took the man who listens to horses and it created a field guide for it so that it's a kind of a contemplative Brené Brown piece, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Brené Brown. Very good. Name dropper. I yeah. like that. She is good. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it was nice to do a sort of a refresh of Man Who Listens to and make it rele relevant to, to the next generation. It is. It's been 25 years, 30 years. Um, so it is a generation now that's gone by without really analyzing how did we start this whole deciding that there is a language with horses and and how horses react to us is actually something that we can affect and that they're sentient beings or they're, they're more intelligent than we were giving them credit for, you know, back to Anne. Anna Sewell, who wrote Black Beauty, you know, where right. she was starting to figure these things out with the, the coming from the, the horse's voice and talking about people. And so without going down a rabbit hole or anything, I think I think it's really fun to think about the opposite of what's my horse's personality. Forget that. Horses are fine. They've they, you know, there, there are some that are chill and there's some that are more sensitive, but basically horses are horses and they have a really consistent reaction. It's us. <laughs> it's us humans that are all over the place and we want to do right by our horses. But I think, you know, your background in DISC and we should talk a little bit. I've introduced you, but we should talk about why you have the authority to work with this kind of background. Like how many DISC assessments have you done in your lifetime? 
<laughs> I don't think it's authority. I think it's craziness. <laughs> you are. Very, <laughs> I think, yeah. So I work with corporations and foreign nonprofit organizations worldwide to develop effective cultures that are usually focusing on things like improving trust and ensuring transparent communication, leveling the playing field. Um, helping leaders get a grasp on how to motivate and retain talent mm-hmm. in a very, but in a, in a very genuine way, not in a contrived or not in a con sense, but in a real sense, how can we create the kind of culture that we want to have here that will attract and retain talent? And since we spend most of our waking hours at work, or many of us do, I'm hoping someday, Debbie, that I'll retire to, you know, <laughs> somewhere far, far away, but, um, No. So most of us work a lot and we would rather be working in an environment that's conducive to our sense of self-worth and trust. So I'm I'm thinking about that question. And and I think writing styles maps beautifully to a Monty quote, which I will share. So Mm. get ready for this one. So here's his quote. A horse trainer must keep in mind that the idea that the horse can do no wrong And any actions taken by the horse, especially the young unstarted horse, was most likely influenced by you. And and that's exactly, you know, where we come into the conversation with writing styles. Writing Mm -hmm. styles puts the onus of the relationship back on the human. And it is a takeoff on DISC, which is a very well-known organizational assessment tool. It's a learning tool and validated and is used widely throughout the throughout the world to help people understand their styles or approaches at work. Yeah, and so, DISC stands for, in case people are going like, I've yeah. heard of that somewhere, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, so DISC stands for four different styles, direct and confident, persuasive and friendly, calm and consistent, and precise and detailed. And I want you to imagine a line like an imaginary line extending from left to right. And if that would signify, or let's have it represent a project or a task. And imagine the the people that gravitate towards a task at the beginning phase, in the middle, in the end. And folks that come in in the beginning are those direct and confident. I don't need a lot of detail. Let me get going. Then they're joined by persuasive and friendly, helpful people that say, oh, poor you, you look like you're struggling. Let me get involved. And then later on, as the project develops and it has it has some identity to it and detail, then it attracts people who are calm and consistent in understanding what's expected. And at the very end of that arrow or the task or the project, we see people congregating who are kind of, oh, this isn't quite right. They're, they're, they kind of think in an analytic way, and they're very precise and detailed, and they're not thinking, how can I make this arrow better, this project better? Mm-hmm. And so we all gravitate to different parts of that project right but anyway and, so you and, you, and that you help people you help people learn to deal with the others right no matter where you are on that spectrum the yeah. the most frustrating thing is to be one and not understand why there is another so i mean people are starting to think about their horses when we're, they're listening to this but if we go in direct and dominant and our horse isn't then you're going to have you're going to have to tone it down. You're going to have to have some scooch room and flexibility in there. And that's, I think, why we were interested in writing styles and getting people to understand a little bit more about how to relate to their horse. So you got started with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like the caveman principle. We want to take people from understanding differences to actually appreciating them and valuing them to actually leveraging them. So exactly what you just said. How about this one? Um, There are times to be direct and confident. There are times to be persuasive and friendly with your horse. There are times to be calm and consistent, and there are times to be precise and detail-driven. And we sometimes match uh, by by luck or intention where the horse is, and that's a happy thing. And sometimes we mismatch. And as you just said, we can overplay being too direct. We can overplay being too precise with a horse that isn't ready. And so the question then becomes, where is your preference? Because you can change, you can change your style as long as you understand how to, how and when, Mm -hmm. but you can't necessarily choose your style. Does it make sense? Like you can't, you know, you are what you are and you get what you get. And, but if you're a little bit aware of it and you can say, my gosh, I'm being too friendly and too 
to uh, persuading here. What I need to do is put a hard stop to this dangerous behavior or, you know, I'm being way too calm and steady and I need to shake this up because I'm bored or the horse is bored or we aren't progressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of my issues too. I, I took the, the assessment and went, no wonder I allow a little bit of seepage on that discipline thing. (laughs) But tell us, were you picking on my assessment? Your style because it's exactly what I pictured. Oh, good. Um, she figured me out. Very kind, so, very so what are yeah. the stories that, that people might <laughs> just tell, tell me one or two things that people maybe <laughs> approach you with and say, you know, I don't get this assessment thing, but I'm having issues with my horse about X. <laughs> what are some of those well, things people can relate to? It is. So people have come up to me at a quine affair and said, I hope you're speaking to packed audiences someday because we all need to hear the message that who we are is great, but there are times that we are, you know, kind of blindsided. We have blind spots and we're, we're approaching the horse and in a way that isn't as useful as it can be. And when I thanked the lady, she said, no, I think you need to, to speak to, um, you know, you know, uh, uh, packed stadiums because we all need to hear this. And I said, wow, uh, here's $5. You know, I'm thinking, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. but it, it is, you know, it's a wonderful assessment. It's limited, It's but it's interesting. And how is it limited? You're not just your preference. You can change that by saying, this isn't working with my horse. So if you're a D direct, um, there might be an opportunity for you to slow down and just appreciate where the horse is and not where you want the horse to be. If you're an I influential, it might be wonderful to Think about pleasing yourself as well as your horse. And so if you think it, it of course, may not want to go out on a, on a trail ride, but you do, then it might be one of those things where you can kind of negotiate that. If you're an S steady, there might be an opportunity to step up and take a few risks. Mm-hmm. And if you're a C conscientious, there might be an opportunity to think about lowering uh, what we call your high standards and, and think about where the horse is so they can catch up mm-hmm. with you. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. Yeah. And I love that you, you've been doing this for so long that you know that people will, if, if, if somebody is willing to be flexible with their horse and try to be, let's say in my case, a little firmer about the black and the white lines, but also be a little more empathetic with those people that are, if you're a a trainer who is working with people, giving lessons and things too, you're going to have to deal with every kind of style. Have you ever had any of the lesson givers want their students to take this? Yeah. In fact, that's a great idea. And we do have an addition of writing styles for writing instructors and, and, and and students can take the the assessment so that instructors can get a handle on who do I have in front of me? What is this person going to expect? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, are they uh, fast paced? Are they wanting a relationship first? Are they wanting a a plan so there are no surprises? Or do they have a certain objective that they want to achieve, kind of a high standard that I should hit? That, it'd be mm-hmm. a wonderful thing for, for an instructor to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. Did they ever lose lose the right to buy a horse after that? <laughs> Sometimes I, yeah. I think we, we bought the wrong horse for the wrong reasons, too. And that's part of our personality, I suppose, too. So, I mean, it is a personality assessment. But it, what I love that is that you've really drilled down on, yeah, that's our personality. But you give us writing styles. You have 15 types of patterns that people can right. fall into. That's a lot. So it's not just four types. How did right. how did the patterns get decided? So the patterns are a result of where you are on the original graph. The assessment is digital and uh, can be uh, available through paper copies and in in as many numbers as you need. But the digital copy is about a twenty page document, and there is a centerpiece in that document, Debbie, that has the as you know that has the your core profile on it. Yeah, right. And the profile relates to segments on the table, the answer table, which then translate into pattern styles. I know that sounds like really, you know, let me, let me try to build It makes that more sense when you that. see it, but yeah, 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 yeah. Explain that. And so you have a pattern and the pattern is a series of strengths and challenges that you can kind of ponder about and say, okay, so if this is me, what do, what do I need to do um, in order to, to achieve my goal of whatever your goal is, joy. Um, perfect writing, um, showing, um, 
pleasure, you know, barrel racing. And so it kind of gives you a time to just kind of sit there and read that pattern and say, okay, here's some thoughts for myself as I, as I go to ride. It's a very useful way in my mind of getting feedback and not asking anybody, but actually asking yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, how am I doing? How am I showing up to my horse? We don't have to share this. Yeah, we don't have to share this with anybody. But so mine ended up being the advising riding pattern out of the 15. And I've got my two, my two columns in the middle are very high. But basically, what I love is that you give me, you know, the walking orders, um, not really, but because I get to set that whole plan out myself, there is a page for that too. But yep. it, my pattern goal, it seems the way I shape up my personality is to be close with the horses and with you know, whoever I'm riding on the day. And the values of that style is that uh, there's a consistency, which I, I love. I look for the consistency. Can developing a good, let's see, can develop a good emotional relationship with their horses comprised of trust and understanding. Yahoo um, figured me out. Typical emotion, it's often, often welcoming and kind-hearted. And you know this because we've had to to answer, how many questions are on there? I don't know. But it's what you think you're the most of and what you think you're the least of. And so you tick it off and um, eventually you can't hide. The, the, The personality traits that you have are going to shape you into some pattern that you have with you and your horse, between you and your horse, or you and your horses, um, whoever right. you're working with, which is kind of fun because right. it's honest, right? I mean, a lot of us think we're, oh, uh, we're really, maybe we think we're dominant with our horses, but we're really marshmallows, actually. Uh, you know, and maybe we think that we are uh, very communicative, but maybe we're not. Maybe we're just overanalyzing everything. And I think there's so many of us that are using the word confidence today about riding the horse. They want confidence. They want to build confidence. They lack confidence. All these confidence words are coming out. And I think, mm-hmm. what you know what? Are, is it even true? Maybe there is just a lack of direction in how you're handling your horse or how you want to be handling your horse. And this, I think, pinpoints a lot of goals that you can set out for yourself just by being honest. And for that, I love it. And I think that's something that dad and I have both wanted for people is to be, when they're with their horses, they are at their happiest. And you can't be at your happiest if you are perplexed, not confident or, you know, worried that you're ruining your horse in some way or somehow. And we want people to be with their horses and be happy. So that's why I think we got behind this. Yeah. And I think in this issue of being a partner to your horse is, is the, is the critical ingredient here. I think there's absolutely, you're right. So the assessment writing styles is intended to help people exhale and appreciate their styles and who they are. It's not intended to change them. And yet it can be very useful for me to know that along with the strengths I have, there are blind spots and challenges. Mm -hmm. I will overemphasize my preference of being directive and have in the past um, is an example. I had a young horse I was training and I backed him into a corner, eyes on eyes, and that's not what was, was called for at all. We all needed to calm down because he was terrified of a loud noise, and I was terrified that I was losing control. So instead of exhaling, relaxing, I went into my style, which is dominant, and we all do that. So we all get into our styles, mm-hmm. and we all have a tendency to forget that there are other ways of handling a situation that might be more effective in a given moment. So yeah, you know, is, is the, um, the assessment intended to change you? No, but it is, it is intended to increase your awareness Mm. so that you have an opportunity to really begin to work on yourself and your intentions when you ride. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Uh, There's nothing better than a bunch of communication and more information as far as I'm concerned. So I appreciate that you are bringing that to the surface and we are going to, uh, how do people find it, how to get their assessment? How do they find out about it? Oh, sure. Yeah, the website. Yeah. Sure. It's at writingstyles.com. It's R-I-D-I-N-G style. So it's writingstyles.com and 
I think the assessment is under eight dollars. It's probably seven ninety nine now, and it's um, available for immediate download. So you log in and and use PayPal and take the assessment, and then receive it in your inbox in your email. Yeah, and, and if can, if people uh, have questions about it, can they they can certainly get a hold of me, Debbie at MontyRoberts dot com. Yeah. Can they can yeah. they contact you too? Sure, both of us at S Kane at corplearning.com. And Debbie, do we have time to play a little game, do you think? You'd have to tell me. Yeah, we have time. What, what's the game? <laughs> You're so so what I'd like to do with your listeners is give them, again, a quick reminder of the four predominant styles that, you're right, are broken into 15 patterns. But the four predominant styles, uh, and then I'm going to kind of walk you through that, and then I'd like to give you a scenario and have you guess the style. So the, Okay. So there's a lightning round at the end where you can win millions, and then there's kind of just a basic round, okay? If I make it, if I make it, okay. Are you ready? So let me refresh. Let's look at the arrow, that fake arrow, pretend arrow I asked you to create in your mind from start to finish, left to right. Okay. People that like to start things and jump in quickly, de-direct. Yeah. People that like to join strugglers and help out I influential. People that like to join later when the situation is a bit under control, C or S, I'm sorry, steady, calm, and consistent. And people at the very end who want to wait and, and they want to uh, analyze and, and how, to, how to make that situation better. And we call it C, conscientious or precise and detailed. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Are we ready? So mm-hmm. we have D, dominant, I, influential, a steady, and C, conscientious, okay? Got it? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Okay, here we go. This scenario is called the trail ride. Okay. Here we go. So you're planning a trail ride with friends, and there are four people in this scenario that you get to identify and guess their style. Okay. The first one is Jory. Jory bursts into the barn at the last minute, ready to ride without any fuss. She says, I'll groom after the ride. Name her style. Ding, ding, ding. D, right? She's direct. That's correct. You got oh, it. Oh, you have a little yeah. ding, ding, ding right there. Yeah. Okay. Here's the bit. Here's the sound you get if you get didn't get it right. There you go. Okay. Okay. The second one. Mike has been to the barn. Mike has been at the barn for a while, grazing his horse and mucking his stall. He's concerned about the fit of his saddle and doesn't want to hurt his horse on the trail ride. Oh, and so he would stall. be probably precise and detailed. He would be a C. Well, well, let me help you with some clues and back up on this. Are you ready? Yes. So Mike has been at the barn for a while, grazing his horse and mucking his tail. He's concerned about the fit of the saddle, which is, yes, I see, but he doesn't want to hurt his horse. What okay, is he so concerned he's, about? He must be persuasive and friendly. You're right. He's influential, persuasive, and very friendly. Okay. Here we go. Ooh, that was a hard one. You know, I just little, lost yeah. a lot of money. A little unsteady now. there. I know. <laughs> okay. Millions of points. <laughs> you ready for the next one? I don't know. Here we go. <laughs> Annie has been at the barn for hours preparing for the ride, and she carefully cleaned her stall. She groomed her horse and oiled her tack, Debbie. Oh, and nice. she's finishing writing in her journal before the ride begins to make sure oh, everything gosh. goes well and <laughs> as planned. This must be my C. No. What? No. The well, steady? Say, oh, my gosh. There. There's, only, there's only four. <laughs> but I'm going to say not necessarily. Okay, I will not say, necessarily. I'll give you a little bit. What makes you say that? Let me ask you. The, uh, the amount of detail. I was on precise and detailed. Okay, so yes, yes, so she, she's kind of calm. This calm is why you're the doctor and I'm not the doctor. <laughs> This is why you make these assessments. You don't want me doing this stuff. I'd, I'd be okay, like, well, hurry up. I just want to get out the door. I'm equally puzzled. I'm sorry. Okay, I one think. You, can get this, you can get this one right. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Drew arrives early, as well as in his finest riding attire. And he calls this his trail outfit. Mm-hmm. He has timed the exercise, his exercise and training for his horse prior to the trail ride to prepare for a better trail ride. He is talking with another rider about the correct merits of fly spray that he uses and why it's better than the one the other person is using. Name the style. Well, the only one left is, no, no, we had I already. I'm sorry. So we've got C. 
It's the only one left. Is that the precise and detailed finally? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is. It was the conscientious. He is a person that's very interested in ensuring that he does things the right way according to his own style. Yeah. So these people would drive it, me crazy, that, Sue. Do you have these people at your barn? Did we just name people at your barn? Did we? <laughs> well, I have something I have something frightening to say. Yes, we did. No, we're going to in a minute, though. But I have to say that most of us are two styles. And most of us are, for example, direct and, and let's get going, coupled with influential and friendly. And some of us are S, steady, oh, no, I need a plan, coupled with I got to do it right, conscientious. And some of us are a combination entirely different than what I just sure. mentioned. Uh, but we yeah. primarily have two styles. Did you have two styles when you took the assessment or no? Uh, no, yeah. no. I, I mean, I have two that are high, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's right. You had SI, I believe. Correct. Can I say? Yeah, I just absolutely. Did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am off the charts with my eye. I'm like practically at the top, <laughs> like ding. You know, the, like when you the mallet hits the bell, yeah, it goes all the way to the top, and then I am just slightly below that for my S. Obviously, my my D and my C dropped off the charts on the other end, or we wouldn't have the numbers. So, yeah, I'm That's right. yeah, yes, very kind and and patient, and loving, and you would be you picked out all the good part. qualities. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> have a very nice. Day. Uh, well, anyway, this is a, it is a lot of fun, and I have taken a DISC assessment, or maybe a lot of people have before too, in uh, sure. their work or in, you know, if they have a kind employer who's been uh, conscientious that way, maybe he is a C, I'm not sure, <laughs> and and have uh, allowed people to, to take that. I think it's a wonderful thing for people to know, you know, even at a young age too, when they're in high school, college, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to kind of know about yourself and how to work with other people. But doesn't that sound like an I speaking <laughs> when I say that, yeah. but, yeah. but I, I do like to be able to work with other people too. And I do want to know how I'm affecting my horse. I do want to know where my strengths and weaknesses and my blind spots are. And that's why I think this is fun. Well, and I think you call up something really interesting. It's also interesting to know who you're riding with and what their styles are. And some of us get along very well with other people that we ride with. And other, others of us are always looking at certain individuals who are either exactly like us or very different. And we just can't seem to make it work. And why doesn't that relationship work? And how can we both kind of style flex mm -hmm. to get that thing to work? That's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Sue, it's always fun to have you back. I appreciate you, uh, this coming out party too, for writing styles and, uh, the, the work that's gone into it with your team there too. I know that you've had a lot of people involved in developing this, so we're going to give them kudos in our show notes too. That's right. Well, thank okay. you for having me. I appreciate it very much. And let's hope that, uh, folks find it equally interesting. We'll be offering some podcasts coming up and there are lots of resources on the website. Mm -hmm. that they can have uh, free of charge. Yeah, writingstyles.com. Right. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place in the world. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, I am sending this email to you because I have heard that you are the famous horse whisperer. I have just watched the movie, and although I can see elements of a join-up when Robert Redford makes friends with the difficult horse, I do not understand the business of the final part where he ties up one of the horse's forelegs. I don't understand the objective nor the reason for doing so. Can you help me? Monty's answer. Dear Chris, if you only knew how similar yours and my position is, it would astound you. I have watched horse trainers utilizing these and similar techniques for more than 70 years now, and I have not understood their purpose one day of my life. Where the Horse Whisperer movie is concerned, you should know that I was being sent manuscripts from the author for months before there was a decision to include these techniques in the book and then ultimately in the movie. I was shocked. Making calls immediately, I was certain that it was only a matter of time until I could have an agreement to remove this violence. 
I communicated with the author's advisors at the time who assured me they would execute these practices with love and concern for the horse. Immediately, I pointed out that no matter how careful they were, it would send a bad message to the world. I suggested that it would infer that violence works and that tying the horse down would somehow solve the problems he had. My messages fell on deaf ears with everybody connected with the film, and I was forced to walk away and watch this atrocious horsemanship in a movie theater. It was a sad day, but I assure you that I did everything I could to change their minds. As I interpret the storyline, Pilgrim was a victim of a road accident with a truck. The actions of vets and handlers seemed to him to be more pain and aggression, and he became angry and fought back, believing that his life was in danger. The ultimate conclusion in the movie was that he needed to re-become subservient to the human race. The methods you saw were meant to suggest that tying him down would somehow cause him to resubmit. Because it was a movie, they could make it seem to work. Obviously, my solutions would have been to use the body of work that I recommend in my textbook from my hands to yours. Clearly, violence was the last thing that Pilgrim needed, and in my opinion, there was no way to accept the methods you saw in that movie. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it too on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online too on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. January and February, he is in Australia training thoroughbreds. And then March 6th through 8th, we'll have a horse and healing clinic back at Flag is Up Farms in Solvang, California. Then we'll also have another one May 1 through 3. And then May 14, that's Monty's 85th birthday. We're going to have some cake then. Even though he doesn't eat cake anymore, we'll make him eat a bite. May 18 through 22, advanced exams are with Denise Heinlein and Monty. At Flag is Up Farms. That's May 18 through 22. And then June 21, 22, and 23 are very special in our annual calendar this year. It's the Movement 2020 with Monty Roberts, Till Grandin. We have Rick Lamb as our host and um, an MC. And we have some amazing from across the health spectrum and across the horse training spectrum, outstanding speakers and trainers. So you got to look on that website, the Movement. 2020.com. And then June 29 through July 3, we have Monty Special Training Brazil. So that'll be in Portuguese. Then July 24 through 26, we have Horse and Healing again. That's for our veterans with post-traumatic stress and also first responders. We've been doing that since 2010. And then August 3 through 7, we have Amani Special Training. That's just like the one in Portuguese, only this one's in English. We've been doing that for years, uh, probably 15 years now. And it, it is our probably most special training that Monty does all year because he works through horses for five days straight. And then August 17 to 28 is our newer course. It went five or six years now, I think. Gentling Wild Horses. And it is what it sounds like. We bring them on in untouched and we work for two weeks, just a little bit every day on each horse. And they go from wild to willing. And then September 11 through 13 in Solvang, California at Flag is Up. We have a busy weekend, a busy three days because we have a horse sense and healing going on at the same time that we have an equine facility management certification through CHA, our Certified Horsemanship Association weekend. And so I get to have Christy Landwehr um, up around the kitchen table at night and then um, certifying people during the day. And it's a really fun time. And we have uh, an extra CHA instructor with her as well. It's a great thing to have too. So September 11 through 13. There we go. I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Sure. May 18 to 22 of 2020. If you're listening to this in 2023, it's over. Advanced exams with Denise Heinlein and Monty. Explain Mm -hmm. what advanced exams are and who's taking them. 
They sound hard, don't they? Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> so if just like Jamie Jennings did, who does our, our reads our tips daily here, and then there are several courses that one can take at the school. You can do a very simple course, starting with Horsemanship 101. You can do a join up, a long lining. You can do, you know, just the introductory courses two weeks long. This is kind of the steps that people can take. But if you just want to be certified, you take the intro course, the intro exams. And then after you take those exams, you start sending videos in. And when you send those videos in, we have instructors that analyze them give you feedback, notes, tell you what to go back, work on, send more videos in if you need to. And then if you're accepted, you can come and take the advanced exams. Right now, we only offer them once or twice a year because it's based on the number of people that qualify. And that means that you come during those advanced exams and you get your wild horse. We, we actually call them project horses. And this is where Jamie, if some people have heard a uh, horse in the morning, Jamie's um, progress and process to tame, really gentle, precious magic gallop Jennings, the horse that she uh, eventually let adopt out to uh, a family and a young girl who is a uh, it's very clever with her. And uh, she pulled a cart, the horse did, pulled a cart and did everything that, you know, horses shouldn't do at her age, really, unless they're really, really, really gentle. And she did that. So that's part of those advanced exams. It's really fun. There are a couple of weeks, three weeks, I think, long. And they they have to know everything from confirmation, every muscle in the body, every bone in the body. And I'm see, I'm talking people out of it right now. It's really, really, really hard. But the good news is... Our certified instructors are really, really, really qualified. They're very good. They're like a master's degree. So when when a person is taking the advanced exams, mm -hmm. they're they're taking the final steps towards becoming a certified instructor. Yes. That's the goal. It is, and in yeah. fact, they're not finished once they pass those. Assuming they pass those, then they go to the internship program. And what's the internship program teach them at that point? Because they know everything, right? They're masters. No, they, they haven't actually demonstrated that they can teach yet. So advanced exams is all about the mastery of this, you know, skill sets. But teaching, as we all know, is another art again. And so then they go the internship, which is generally about three months, unless somebody wants to go longer and needs to go longer. It's generally about three months. And that's where they have the opportunity to teach every kind of course and work with a lot of different students course under the guidance of a certified instructor that's teaching there in the advanced level. It's a lot of fun because that's where they get to play with what they've learned, you know, and, mm -hmm. and really get immersed in it and, and have their project courses too. And so it's a lot of fun. So it's, it's, it's a pretty significant um, commitment. Oh, yes. One of these times we're going to have to, I'm going to have you do this, Debbie, sometime okay. in the year 2020, Okay. <laughs> you are going to set aside an episode. All right. And I'm going to interview you and you're going to tell me all about the process of becoming a certified Monty Roberts. Good idea. Instructor. It's a good idea. It's a really interesting thing too, because a lot of people have heard some of our episodes on here where we have the advanced students speak and we usually do a little uh, in a round and they're amazing because the accents, the backgrounds, uh, they're so interesting alone that I, that's why I love having them on there and learning why, what's their passion for learning more about the horsemanship and, and all those things too. But we never really do talk about the process. You're right, Jen. So let's do that. That. There we go. It'll be fun. Look, look for it coming up in 2020. Thank you. I got it on my list. And if you <laughs> couldn't remember all of that, because you're probably driving or cleaning a star or riding a horse right now, or driving so. one, <laughs> yeah. you can find out all of that and so much more on the website, montyroberts.com. And you can also call Flag is Up Farms. Lots of nice folks there who know what's going on. And the phone number is 805 688 6288. And for details about today's show, episode 153, go to horsemanshipradio.com. And there you will find links about today's topics and guests, photos, and more stuff. And mm -hmm. we love your feedback. If you have things that you would love to hear Debbie talk about, people that you would love Debbie to interview, the yeah. place to let her know is on Facebook. Go to, my, go to Facebook and type in there Monty Roberts and click on it. Follow him, like him. And you can also follow and like Monty Roberts on Twitter and Instagram in both places. It's Monty underscore Roberts. 
Mm -hmm. And in order to not miss any episodes of Horsemanship Radio or any other podcast on the Horse Radio Network, you can go to your app store, type in there Horse Radio Network in the search bar and download the free app. It works for your iPhone or your Android. Perfect. And many thanks to our sponsors, too. That's Omega Fields, Cavallo Horse and Rider, and Monty Roberts University. Be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. <laughs>